here to discuss crafting narrative. It's specifically focused on people who are staring at a blank page. I appreciate that situation, and we're going to see what we can do to fix it. Okay. First thing I wanted to do is, on behalf of myself, I would like to thank you all. I gave a presentation similar to this with the projector two years ago in Edinburgh. Uh, and one of the things that I discovered in doing a presentation on how to do a better job of crafting narrative, I'm requesting everybody come up close because I have slides but no slide projector. So we're going to be conducting a great experiment in how well I can uh, describe the slides using <laughs> my voice only. It's sort of like writing narrative, right? <laughs> uh, Would it help if we close our eyes? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll try that in a different experiment. Okay. Okay. Move the table a little closer. What's that? Yeah, but I don't know that it would do enough good. We've, we've got actually enough people so that we've got a lot of people. I'll, I'll be trying to do this more with my voice than with anything else. Uh, but in any event, I wanted to thank you all when I did a very similar presentation two years ago in Edinburgh. Uh, I discovered after that I had done the presentation that explaining how to write narrative to other people really improved my narrative writing. Okay, and so I wanted to thank you all for helping me with my writing. So, very quickly, what is narrative? Uh, narrative is not the plot, that's way too grandiose an idea. It's not the individual sentences, uh, that's uh, you know, an editing job. Uh, it's uh, specifically, if you look in the dictionary, it's all about uh, a series of connected paragraphs that tell a story. That's what narrative is. Uh, now, we're going to uh, get into that uh, very quickly, but uh, first, I have a high priority item for all of you that touches a little bit about the, the way in which narrative and individual sentences come together. I'm inspired to tell you all about this because my wife is Lynn Stigler who is the boss of editors for LMBPN, and she has a number of uh, nits to pick with, uh, with many authors. And so we're going to say a few words about uh, some of the things that you want to do to your sentences in your paragraphs. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the fact that you want, and this is for narrative, for the sake of your narrative, you want to make all of your sentences Faster and tighter, okay? Uh, one of the in particular problems that, uh, that Lynn sees frequently is a thing she has called robo-narrative, wherein the uh, writer starts describing the individual motions, the physical motions of the physical body of the main character, and it's sort of like watching Michael Jackson do a robot, you know, go do, do, do a robot dance. Uh, you'll have to get the slides to look at this, but there are a couple of very helpful examples in the slides of uh, things like, he told Lenora to hold by raising his arm vertically to head height with his fist clenched. <laughs> and Lynn edited that down to, he signaled with a raised fist, Lenora froze. Okay, tighter and faster, tighter and faster. That way you can keep your reader engaged, and that's particularly important in the modern age where many of your books are going to wind up in audio format. Now, I'm an old trad pub guy. Back in the old days, there, you know, no, almost nobody's books were, were, were made into audio, but today, lots of books Probably many of yours will be made into audio. And so you need to be thinking about how well your reader is going to understand the story when he's driving 70 miles an hour down the expressway and a truck goes zooming by. 
okay? You need to keep your description of, of the physical actions succinct so that he can understand what's going on under those somewhat less than ideal circumstances. Now we also want to make it all punchier, okay? Faster, tighter, punchier. We, uh, uh, the, an important part of the narr of narrative is the creation and the release of tension. Uh, in fact, that's pretty much all we're doing all the time when we're telling the stories. We're creating tension and we're releasing it over and over again. And I was uh, one of the things that I that, that I had happened to me uh, uh, as a favor for a friend. I wound up reading the first chapter of somebody's book, a uh, brand new author, never published anything. And I'm reading along, and I, I finished the first paragraph, and I'm saying, shh. The good news is the guy writes good, clean sentences, okay? Very good. And then by the time I'd gotten to the fifth paragraph, I realized that there was a problem, which is that it was boring, okay? <laughs> Boringness is one of the problems that occurs at the narrative level of, uh, of writing. You want to avoid being bore boring. And so what I said to that brand new beginning author I made a recommendation to him. You might want to consider, even, even if you've written a number of books already, you might want to consider, go through you know, the first chapter, and for each scene, do an evaluation of how much tension uh, is either created or released. Is there a conflict? Is there a discussion of an upcoming conflict? Uh, and then, you know, Give yourselves a score of one to 10 on the amount of tension in that, in that scene. And then also do a one to 10 on how much humor there is in that scene. Because even if you don't have any tension in a scene, you can, it, it's okay if you've got lots of humor. So you need tension or humor or maybe both. One of the, uh, my, my, my example uh, sentence here, uh, is the first evidence of the impending apocalypse arrived in the form of a missing number. Okay, so well we've got an apocalypse coming. I think I'm willing to give that a tension level of ten. What do you think? <laughs> okay, and then there's a missing number, which is kind of ironic in the presence of an apocalypse. So I'm going to give that a humor rating of maybe five. So I got a total of 15 right there in that sentence. Not bad for the scene. Of all the places in your narrative where you most desperately need to be raising the tension and, the, uh, and or the humor is in the very first page of that book. Now in the old days, in the days of Trad Pub, people plunked down 15 bucks for a copy of a book and they sat back in their chair and they were willing to give you a few pages, maybe a couple of chapters uh, of warming up. Okay, they were in for the long haul, baby. But today we're living in the world of Kindle Unlimited. So these people have this incredible banquet of stuff they can read, more than any human being could possibly read in a lifetime. And for those people, you need to be bringing out, you, you need to be hooking them because what they're gonna do is, they're going to go through, they're gonna look at the blurb, they're gonna look at the cover, and if it catches their eye, they'll say, okay, I'll read the first couple paragraphs. And they read the first couple of paragraphs and it hooks, and if it hooks them, they'll read it. But if they're not hooked after the first couple of paragraphs, baby, they're gone. Okay? So you gotta hook them. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> we have, uh, we are no longer living, you know, we are now living in the world of uh, flash crowds and cut jumps. You know, we're competing with everybody else for their attention. Uh, so, uh, one of my favorite opening lines for a book in the modern era, it's not Call Me Ishmael, 
that doesn't quite hook us enough anymore. But my favorite uh, I, I, is from Wen Spencer. Uh, first line of the book, the wards chase the elk over Pittsburgh scraps, chain link fence shortly after the hyperphase gate powers down. Now I love this sentence because it tells you all about the universe. It tells you that there's a, uh, that it's a magical universe because there's an elk. It tells you that it's an alternate earth because it's in Pittsburgh. And it tells you that this is a science and technology world because there's a hyperphase gate. Okay, we've got the background, but even better, the most important part is the elf is about to be murdered. Okay, and so uh, so we got that tension going as well. Okay, so that's the sort of thing you're striving for, and I've never achieved this level of excellence in, in my first sentence. This is this is definitely. Um, now, those of you who write romance may think, you know, I don't really need all of that stuff. I mean, romance, you know, kind of slower burning kind of stuff. Well, uh, when I first ran into that as an observation, I went off to Amazon and I looked at the first page of each of the three top selling romance novels under Kindle Unlimited. If you're not KU, you got a different set of rules, but if you're doing KU, okay, it turns out that even the romances introduce some combination of humor and conflict in the very first paragraph. Okay, you gotta get out there, bring them in. And for every, uh, For every possible scene that you can pull this off, you want to end the scene with a punchline, I'm just showing you the laser uh, here in the picture. Uh, but uh, you, you want to end that scene with a punchline that will lure the reader into going on to the next scene, right? So uh, we talked about the apocalypse a little bit earlier from the same book. There's another line. This is the end of a scene. Where is she? What could possibly be more important than preventing the apocalypse? There's something more important than in preventing the apocalypse? Maybe I'd better go on to the next scene and find out what that is. Now we're going to talk about integrating the narrative with the background of the scene and of the characters to both accelerate the rate at which you can, at which you can write and increase the number of words that you're ex delivering for your KU sales in a way that's useful and enriching for the reader rather than the robo-narrative that I talked about earlier. So the most famous uh, piece of writing about narrative in history is a letter that Chekhov wrote for his brother. And this letter was just full of pithy words of wisdom for the author. Uh, and, one, and one of the most famous of them is the basic idea, show, don't tell. Very basic rule, but it's one that's easy to forget, particularly when you're tired and it's midnight and you just want to tell them, you know, you want to show them. Um, his example was, don't tell me the moon is shining, show me the glint of light on broken glass. Now this is not only a richer story, a, a deeper weaving, a higher quality presentation, you know, something that the reader can sink his teeth into. It's twice as many words, okay? So when you show people rather than telling them, you're supplying them a better experience that is also better, that it also has more words, uh, and uh, so it's win-win-win. This applies even more intensely with uh, this, the description of your characters. 
Uh, when you, uh, it, it, you do not want to describe your character, you want to show the character's personality through the things that they do. Uh, you want to hop on that real fast. Uh, in, you know, in the opening, you know, when you're first introducing the, the, the character, but you want to show, not tell. Uh, there, uh, the example I have is of a character who is uh, uh, trying to uh, solve a medical emergency on a boat. On a boat. In the middle of uh, in the middle of a thunderstorm, okay, and this is kind of a crisis. It allows you to have a lot of revealing of the character's personality. Uh, you can't read it from here, uh, but the basic point you, you can look download the slides and look another time. But the basic basic point is as we're showing what she's doing, the reader is learning that this character is humble, relentless and a genius who knows all different kinds of things about all different kinds of fields of science and technology. Uh, and now I could have explained that in just a couple of sentences. Well, you know, she's this uh, relentless, humble genius. Uh, but instead, by showing it, I, I wrote, wrote an entire scene whose purpose was to illuminate the character of of this of this herald. Okay, this one's important. We're going to do a kitchen. Okay, the next section of this presentation is about a kitchen, uh, and what you're going to and what we've got in the kitchen. We've got several doors. We've got an oven. We've got a refrigerator. We've got a table with a giant hernia on it, and there's a little sinker shaker of salt there as well. Oh, and I forgot, there is also a sword hanging on the wall. Okay. Now the sword hanging on the wall sounds sort of like, yeah, you know, you got to use that. You're going to do something with that, right? And indeed, that is known as Chekhov's gun. Okay. We've already talked about Chekhov. Chekhov, uh, one of his comments uh, for his brother was, if you put a gun on the wall, you have to use it, okay? So uh, and lots of people, you know, this is known as Chekhov's gun, uh, and lots of people think that that's a good way of writing. I'm, we're going to play a little game with the concept of Chekhov's gun here in, in, in just a moment. But what we're going to do is, uh, we, since we have successfully fleshed out the scene, the background, where this next uh, next event is going to happen. And we have already fleshed out the characters so that we know how these characters react. Uh, you know, I mean, basically, one of the reasons for showing all, all about the characters is that if you do a good enough job early in explaining the characters, not just for the reader, but for yourself, you get to the point where you know what they will say in response to things that other people do, you know what they will do in response to the actions that other people take. You just know it all, it can, the words can just flow off your fingers. I have discovered for myself that I can write about three times as fast when I really have that character loaded into my head. Okay, three times as fast because you know what that character is going to do in any given situation. So, you know, focus on knowing the character. But anyway, now we know this the kitchen, and we're going to go through a series of different characters who have very different personalities, and we're going to put each one of them into that room, and we're going to have all of them being chased into the room by a killer, okay? And we're going to see how each one of these very different people reacts. The first one we're going to do is Jason Bourne. We all know who Jason Bourne is, right? Okay. We know how he reacts to things. Our second one is Bethany Ann. Uh, some of you, hopefully a, a fair number of you know who Bethany Ann, Ann, Ann is. She's a kick-ass uh, vampire. 
Uh, but anyway, we're going to go through and look at each one of them upon entering this room. Jason Bourne enters the room being chased by a hitman. What does Jason Bourne do? Well, this is Jason Bourne. So what he's going to do is he's going to flip on the burners on the oven. Why is he going to do that? He's going to fill the room with natural gas. And when the hitman comes in, he's going to leap out the window and set the room into a flaming holocaust and roast the hitman, right? That's a Jason Bourne thing to do. Bethany Ann, kick-ass vampire. She doesn't actually run from anybody. Uh, so instead of being chased by the hitman, she strolls into the room, goes to the refrigerator. Remember, we have a refrigerator in here and uh, gets herself a can of Coke, sits on the table and waits for the hitman to show up so that she can snuff him, okay? Okay, you, you don't know these other characters, as uh, surely, but Grandma Jenkins, what happens when Grandma Jenkins runs into the room? Well, first of all, she doesn't run into the room, she hobbles, okay? Uh, she's a little old lady, she's a little bit crusty, feisty, uh, but in any event, when she comes into the room being chased by a killer, what she's going to use as her weapon of choice, she's going to grab the giant Epernier and get ready to bash him on the head. Ping, an itty bitty little ninja, is going to run into the room and she's going to immediately leap and grab the sword off the wall. At last, we got to use the sword for something. But she's just the sort of person who would be happy with the sword. And finally, Dash. Uh, Dash is the character that I described earlier. Uh, she's a super genius. So she runs into the room. And she grabs the shaker of salt and breathes a huge sigh of relief. Now, because the reader already knows Dash, they, don't, you know, they know that Dash has a plan with the salt shaker. Have no clue at all what she's planning to do with the salt shaker, but they have confidence that she's going to do something good with it. Okay, so what we see from this, I'm not going to try to do that. What we see from this is that this kitchen is full of Chekhov's guns. Each item in that kitchen winds up being the gun for some different character. So I like to think of this kitchen as being Chekhov's arsenal, okay? Uh, and again, if you flesh out the, 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 the place where the scene's gonna take place and the character before putting them into that scene, you're going to find that it just flows. The, those words just flow off your, your, your fingertips and it'll be high quality words, okay? So now we're going to take all these guys and we're going to put them into a scene. Uh, so this is Grandma's Kitchen, part one. Uh, Dash runs into the kitchen being chased by an assassin, very highly skilled assassin named Jin Sonny. Some of you will recognize. Uh, and uh, moments after that, Ping, the itty bitty ninja, comes hurtling in uh, being chased by an enormous armored warehound. Okay, she grabs the sword off the uh, off the wall, and she goes and strikes the warehound. But it's not doing much good because it's an armored warehound. Okay, this is not going very well. Grandma Jenkins runs in and grabs up the immense Pernier. She's being chased by a hell fairy. Well, the health fairy just starts to laugh. Okay. So Dash looks around and says, there's got to be a solution to this, I know. And she tells everybody to switch partners. So D Dash grabs the salt and charges at the health fairy that, that, that chased Grandma and throws the salt in the health fairy's face because as we all know, salt is highly toxic for hell, hell fairies. And if you didn't know that, 
well, what are you doing reading this scene after having skipped the first half of the book? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, Pig is now faced off against Jin Sonny, the assassin that was facing Dash. And so the Jin Sonny also has a sword, and say, so they go at it, and they're pretty evenly matched. Okay, we're doing pretty well so far, but wait. Grandma is facing an armored hellhound. Okay. Uh, or werehound, an armored werehound. Uh, so she's in some trouble. Oh no, what's going to happen to Grandma? She turns with her epernier to the hellhound. And then she lowers her epernier and she says, Astro, bad dog. <laughs> And with a punchline, right? We want to end that with a punchline. And yes, that is a callback to earlier in this presentation. Anytime you get the chance in your narrative to make a callback, do it. The, you know, it makes your story much richer. Your readers are going to love it. Uh, and because you understand your character so well, you'll find more opportunities for more callbacks. Okay, finally, here's the bonus. Having, knowing all those characters so well and having finished that scene, the next scene is absolutely obvious, okay? It's probably not a scene that was included in your outline, but it's a scene that screams out to be written and your readers are going to love it. This is a bonus scene with bonus words for your KU unlimited readers. Uh, and uh, basically what happens in the follow-up scene is Dash, since she's a doctor, immediately goes to work trying to, to save the assassin Jin Sani, and she complains to Ping because Ping engaged in overkill. Okay. Ping defends herself from Dash, and in the meantime, Grandma Jenkins is giving them both acerbic commentary during the argument, okay. It's a beautiful scene. When I, when I first did, did a dry run of this for my wife, she looked at it and she said, you know, this is really great. When are you gonna have the rest of the novel? <laughs> no. And finally, Grandma pulls a large wolf cookie from the Apernier and gives it to Astro, the warehouse. Okay, so let's talk about what we just talked about. Uh, tighten up those sentences, making long rambling sentences, robo-narrative sentences. That is, you know, it may get your word count up, but it's not doing your reader any good. It's no good for the reader, and that means at the end of the day, it's no good for you. Stop that. Instead, show don't tell because that will give you many more words that are much higher quality. Make sure, do some evaluation, make sure that each of your scenes raises tension, lowers tension, or delivers laughs. Okay, humor. Use the narrative to show the character. And once you've used the narrative to show the character, let the character drive the narrative, right? They should be as one. And once you've got the, the characters driving the narrative, now you're going to find that periodically there are scenes, beautiful scenes, just waiting to be written that you had not known were there for you, the bonus scenes. Okay, and last but not least, teach narrative to somebody else. I promise you that you will learn how to do narrative better through this act of teaching. Okay, what questions does anybody have? Yes. Um, how can an author really do a good job evaluating and grading their own work once it's in? 
Well, how, how much time do you need to get a perspective on it? Um, well, so, I mean, one of the things you want to do is you want to find some, uh, some, some beta readers. Some, okay. Yes, yeah, some beta readers. Uh, make sure that you get some curmudgeonly beta readers, okay? Uh, you know, I mean, your best friends uh, are not going to help you make the story better. Uh, I myself, uh, you know, when about by the time I get to the halfway, to the, uh, about a third of the way through a novel, I find myself wondering, is this the worst thing I've ever written? I don't know, I can't tell. And so the first thing I do, I, so I, I do this graduated process. I'll send it to, one, I'll, at first I send it to one of my oldest friends, and he always loves all of my books, and so that feels really good. <laughs> but I know, but, 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 but what the real point of that is, is it gives me the strength to go ahead and send uh, you know that that, that 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 those sections of the book off to uh, off, off to my more curmudgeonly uh, readers uh, gives me the strength to survive their criticism. Uh, <clears throat> so, as far as this business of evaluating the tension in each one of the scenes in like your first chapter, I mean that's just something you ought to do really quickly. You know, I mean, is there is there a conflict? Is there a discussion of conflict in the scene? Did you at least smile at some point because there's some witty thing said in the scene? If you don't have any of those things, you got to do something with that scene. Okay. Yes. So what, if you're doing a scale from one to ten, what level of conflict at minimum would you want to at least be looking for, or is there? A level? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I can't answer that one. I, I will tell you that the romance people, even though they need to have conflict. In those first, in that first page, uh, you know the, the kind of conflict they're going to have is much more uh, uh, a conflict of personalities, uh, much less running or killing the elf. Uh, so, so you have to you have to be. Uh, I'm reluctant to try to to define that any more carefully. But you, Science fiction guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, two of my all-time favorite stories, and, I, and they, I think these qualify as excellent in terms of narrative, are uh, one is the short story *Star Dance* by Spider Robinson and Jeannie Robinson. Okay, uh, beautiful piece of craftsmanship. And the other one is, uh, oh yeah, dropping, it's by Bernard Vinge. It's again a short story. You know, I mean, when you're writing a short story, you can, you, you can make that a short story into a jewel, right? Okay, you, you, you can't do that with a, with a novel in general. But uh, he did one, True Names, Bernard Vinge, True Names. Both uh, very powerful narratives, very emotional stories. Yes? You seem to be giving stories with a lot of tension and a lot of buildup, something to grab a reader. But yeah. how do you do that without making it seem to the reader that you're just throwing something out there that doesn't necessarily feel connected to it? Well, if, 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 if your story doesn't have any tension and stuff, you've got a different problem, okay? I mean, so, so it ought to be something that has something to do with the story. Now, uh, I, you, you know, this one example I gave you sort of violates what I just said and sort of plays a little bit to, to answer your question, which is uh, uh, I had this opening scene which 
doesn't have to do with the primary plot, but it has everything to do with introducing the main character. Uh, you know, again, the medical emergency and a ship in a thunderstorm. Uh, the thunderstorm and the medical emergency don't have anything to do with the rest of the story, but it has everything to do with bringing, drawing out the personality of the character in a situation that produces a great deal of tension and anxiety. So that's the sort of thing that you can do. I, you're welcome. So, so, so you can go and read this first scene uh, by just going to Amazon, uh, look for Mark Stigler, look for uh, the Brain Trust, Harmony of Enemies. Uh, you can read that first scene. Again, the medical emergency doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the book, but you can see how tension is brought in uh, for the purpose of elucidating the main character's uh, personality. Uh, it, and I believe it meets the need of drawing it in. So, so for this particular scene, so, 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 so in general, I, I think you're right. You want to be very careful with what I just described, okay? But this particular scene not only elucidates the main character, it also elucidates the world in which it's taking place. This is science fiction, right? There's an enormous amount of world uh, that has to be introduced before you can understand what's going on. These stories are, this particular series of stories takes place on a set of cruise liners in international waters uh, uh, inhabited by all of the immigrant engineers who got expelled from Silicon Valley by the president's block. Uh, and, so, and so what we're doing is we're introducing not only the main character, but we're also introducing the world. Uh, I don't think that anybody who reads that scene and then goes on and reads the rest of the book feels like I, you know, just gave them something random because because you're being immersed in the world. Okay, and there's a plot, you know, there's a main plot that runs through that first book, but it's it, it, it's a, it's every bit as much about building the world as it is about that particular plot. So those are key introductions. What's that? Those are key introductions. Too. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, when you talked about making a callback, yeah, um, is that is that specifically like um, tying up a plot, or are you talking about just referencing something? Referencing something that happened earlier, right? Uh, you know, you you uh, you, uh, you you got here. You know, you, you just did something, and it's similar to something that happened earlier. I I have I just recently did a callback where the character is saying. Uh, uh, where in an early scene, uh, one of the two main heroines uh, uh, befriends a guy, knocks him out, and steals him stuff. And then about three chapters later, the other heroine winds up knocking a guy out, you know, befriending a guy, knocking him out, and stealing his stuff. And she says, after she does that, is this what our lives are going to be like from now on? Meet a guy, knock him out, steal his stuff? Is that what we're doing? That's a callback. <coughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. I hope that the law is not too much of